Hey, Dr. Rick Wallace, the following segment is brought to you by Inbox Dollars. Inbox Dollars is actually something that I used a long time ago when things got really hectic and I needed some income to steady me until I recovered and got some things done. Uh, you're not going to get rich by it, but if you're looking to make some extra money, Inbox Dollars is exactly what you need to check out. Look, you can get paid for taking surveys, opening emails. Uh, and a bunch of other different things. The link to find out how you can do all of this is in the box. It's free to find out, free to sign up. Check it out. I'm out of here. Hey everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope everybody has had a great week and is ready to get this week off to a great start. Uh, as you can see, I'm actually sitting in the office. I did a video while on the way to the office and something happened and it got cut off. So I'm just going to start from scratch and knock this one out. It's not long. I hope everybody's doing great. Um, uh, as I have been doing uh, to this point and probably for a while, um, I'm reminding you that if you haven't sponsored a space in my 25th book, uh, which is Chasing the Ghosts, uh, the quest for black wealth. Um, if you haven't sponsored a space in the book, uh, the information is going to be in the description box. Go in there, click that link, and sponsor a space. What does that mean? It simply means that you're sponsoring a space in the book where you can pay tribute to someone or something. Um, there's no minimum. I'm not asking for a certain amount to, in order to sponsor. Or whatever you decide you want to do, you can sponsor a space. Your name will go in the book and who you are in the paragraph that you want to write commemorating or celebrating or memorializing someone will uh, go under your name um, or be attached to your name. Uh, now, uh, depending on what you do, there are other, you know, some other options that are available to you. And you can see all that in the description box and determine what you want to do. Uh, but I'm inviting everyone to participate. That's why uh, there's no minimum on there. I want anyone who wants to be able to celebrate someone and have it memorialized in print uh, to do so. So that's out there. Now let's talk. Um, I think I've, I've been very clear in uh, communicating the fact that uh, I'm not concerned with what white people think. Uh, I have friends that I actually really truly consider friends because they've been there for me in times uh, when no one else was. So I consider them friends, but they understand with great clarity who my allegiance is to uh, and why. And so I don't spend time explaining and talking about this situation to them. Now, they are aware of the things I do, so they are aware of it, they read it, and they come in and they say they see it. But even if they didn't see it, it wouldn't matter because I'm not asking for their permission to think for myself. I'm not asking for their permission to speak on behalf of my people. I'm not asking white people to accept what I'm saying. My problem is when one of my people show up and decide to regurgitate, reg regurgitate the talking points of whites, uh, to act as a robot and repeat what they've heard with great ferocity and, and great passion and great confidence and certainty, as if they've done the research, as if they truly understand the, the, the dynamic of, of this particular conversation, whatever it may be, about the black experience. And they're speaking from that knowledge rather than simply saying a white person said it, so it must be true. It came from mainstream, the dominant society, so it must be true. Uh, that bothers me. Now, the one thing that having the opportunity to sit up and have this long conversation with Dr. Uh, Cleo Monago and uh, Tony Lizzie, if you haven't seen that video, you need to check it out. Uh, we did a uh, discussion and the, the topic of the discussion was breaking the chains of codependency 
to whiteness, uh, black codependency to whiteness. And in talking with uh, Dr. Monago, who I've been aware of for a while and read his work, and obviously he was aware of me, uh, one of the things that he did was he challenged me just in this conversation to be even more patient and understanding with our people because the position that our people are in in their thinking, the position our people are in in uh, how they approach and view the world is not of their doing in and of themselves. It is a result of something and we have to be aware and those of us who are aware have a responsibility to also be empathetic and understanding. Doesn't mean we're co-signing it, doesn't mean we're giving it a pass, it means that we can't expect everybody to be where we're at. If everybody was where we were at, we wouldn't even have to have this discussion. So in understanding that there's this need for, for patience, but in having patience, there's still this need for me to talk about this phenomenon where blacks tend to uh, behave as if the white man's ice is colder. In other words, if a white scholar doesn't say it, then it doesn't matter how many black scholars say it. If a white uh, person, uh, regardless of educational level, but w well within experience, uh, doesn't say it, then what the black person says doesn't matter. Uh, it needs to be validated. Uh, so much that had been taught for years and years and years by black scholars like uh, Dr. Yosef ben Yakin and Dr. John Howard Clark, Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, um, uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard, and so many more that were taught, and we bu the, the masses buffed it off and pushed it off. All of a sudden became gospel when Tim Wise started talking about it. And all he was doing was regurgitating points that Dr. Claude Anderson and so many before had already said. And it's like, man, what he's saying right now is in my books, but He's getting all this attention. And I care less about the attention he's getting, but I'm saying, why does it take a white person to tell you before you believe it, before you stand on it? Why is it that you would take a white person's word on it? Why is it that you can't look at history and let it tell you that in general, they don't have your best, best interest at heart, that their perception is? And the reason I'm saying is that that was a conversation about what's going on at the border with the Haitians. First of all, before I say anything, let me say that it is my position, and Dr. Monago also spoke on this in the, the uh, conversation we had, um, that Haiti is being punished for their revolutionary spirit. They're being punished because they resisted being conquered. They resisted being uh, colonialized, colonized, and so they repelled. Uh, one of the supposedly greatest generals of all time, Napoleon, and refused to be conquered. And they've been punished for that ever since, economically, politically, socially. And and this is just another way that you, we don't want a, 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 nation, a, a group of people from a nation with a history of rebellion, a history of refusing to be, uh, go figure I don't want you coming to where I am and taking what belongs to me and superimposing your values, your interests, your principles, your philosophies and ideas, your religion upon me. You know, let's let, let you know, God forbid that I actually stand up and say, no, this will not happen and that I am willing to fight to the death to make sure it does not happen. God forbid that happen that whites are so accustomed to being able to control and usurp stuff that doesn't belong to them, that when someone or something sits up and resists, they're actually wrong for wanting to be able to stay and hold what belongs to them. And so the idea that they're coming over here, the last thing they want over here are people with a history that they know, they know their history. They don't want a people with a history that won't fold. They don't want a people of the history of just simply not folding over here, mixing with a people that they've already conquered. And if you want to be honest about it, look at the mindset and the thought processes of the average black person. They don't think they can have it if the white person doesn't give it to them. They don't think that they can go out and make something happen without first asking the permission of white America. 
they're looking for they're looking for anything that we're doing to be co-signed before they get on board. Uh, the reason we had this discussion was because of how many black people are trying to force those of us who refuse to comply into compliance. How vitriolic and how hostile they become when we don't do what the white people want us to do. When we don't talk and say what the white people want us to say. When we don't come across as being friendly to the white person. When our very conversations make the white man uncomfortable. Oh, they want to pull us into their, put us back into place. Why? Because they know that based on how they view the white man, if the white man is uncomfortable, they're uncomfortable. I'll be honest with you. I get a kick out of making white people uncomfortable. I don't move over when I'm walking up on grandma and she got her purse. She clenched her purse. I walk closer. You're going to bump into that damn car running from me. I'm not here to make you comfortable. Hell, I didn't do 246 years. I, my people didn't, didn't enslave your people for 246 years. My people didn't take your people through 12 years of reconstruction. My people didn't take your people through 40 years of black code. My people didn't take your people through 70 plus years of Jim Crow segregation. My people never lynched your people in mass numbers. So what in the hell are you sitting up scared of me for? Oh, you're scared that the, the, the rabbit's going to get the gun. Are you scared that the rabbit already has the gun? Yeah. But anyway, I'm listening to the show and they're talking about what's happening to the Haitians. And here comes this black guy with this white talking point that I've disproven in my research. And I mean, scientific, peer reviewed research. I've set up and refuted, but I'm listening to this clown and he's talking about, you know, none of us. Talking about this reminds you of slavery. Watching this reminds you of slavery. How can it remind you of slavery when you, you neither one of us were born a slave? We never experienced all that. We're being overdramatic. First and foremost, when a person says it reminds them of slavery, it reminds them of what they know about slavery, how things were done, what they've been able to discover, what they've been taught, what they learned on their own. They have a sense. No, we didn't live slavery. We are the descendants of it. We are the product of it. We are the result of it. And that if we trace our behavior, if we trace our spiritual lineage, if we trace our physical lineage, if we trace our emotional lineage, it takes us back to the slavery experience. And we have to be understanding. I did mounds and mounds of research on epigenetics, and I've written on it. I've spoken on it. I've literally been invited to speak internationally on how epigenetics impacts cancer. Our experiences and trauma and the levels of stress created by this is, a, it, it, it is massive. I even did an article on it uh, yesterday because the life expectancy of the black man has dropped again over the last two years, another three years. It's dropped another three years. It's in, in the disparity between white men and black men is widening. And there's a reason for it. And guess what? The research proves it's not because black boys are killing black boys. That's a problem. But even uh, when you do the research and you look at the life expectancy of a 65 year old beyond 65, life expectancy is extremely shorter for the black man than the white man. And it goes into the lived experiences, stress, racism, racism itself is toxic to to the black spirit, to the black physiolo uh, physiology, to the black emotional core. It's toxic. Imagine being a black man and every time a car pulls behind you that has lights on top of it. Your anxiety level goes up. You didn't do anything. But you know that there are people who didn't do anything that died when those lights got came on behind them. God forbid they turned the lights on. Anxiety level goes up enough. Guess what happens? The constant bombardment of that anxiety level going up and triggering what's known as your stress response or the uh, fear response or what we most commonly hear called the fight or flight response. Now you're dumping adrenaline and cortisol into your, your bloodstream frequently, consistently, and some of us are living at a level of stress that's so heightened that it's almost constant. We call it chronic stress. It's literally a medical condition. It kills. Now granted, some of the things are self-induced. 
how we eat. But even that is a descendant nature and reality from slavery. Some of us never let go of that. We call it soul food. But we ate it back then because we had no choice. We got what was left after everything was done. And we had to eat it. That, that's how we lived. But we brought it into our future. We're eating ham hocks and, and oxtails and chitterlings and all of the other stuff that literally should never be touched, much less eaten. Yeah, that's a part of it. Obesity is a part of it. But stress is a part of it. Racism is a part of it. And just the constant stress. And that's just in that sense. And then there are all the things that bear down on our women. Nobody wants to talk about how we got from 75% of our children being born into a two-parent household to 75% of our children being born into a single-parent household and the level of stress and strain uh, it, uh, in, uh, it, it places on that single parent, which is predominantly uh, going to be the mother. All of these things matter. But uh, to hear someone, my whole thing is like, um, I often say, when I say someone is ignorant, when you speak on things you don't know, you expose your ignorance. And my problem is not that you're ignorant, because when I use the word ignorant, I don't use it as an insult. I use it as a state of reality in which all of us exist at some point. Nobody is completely absent of ignorance. There are things I'm ignorant to. It simply means I don't know. But when I expose my ignorance by trying to con uh, hold dialogue or monologue or conversation uh, on a topic that I am ignorant on, it exposes my ignorance and it exposes a weakness. The weakness is I'm speaking on things based on some. We don't we still haven't learned how to search out things. We still haven't learned how to verify and validate things. We still, still haven't learned how to think critically. We don't know how to think critically. We don't know how to think on our own. We're still letting them tell us what to think. We are being, we have been trained and indoctrinated. We have not been educated. And because we have not been educated, we do know how to, we do not, we do not know how to discover things on our own. But the idea of that we, we, we weren't born, neither of us were born slaves. Well, I've proven that you don't have to be born in, in a tr specific traumatic uh, reality in order to have an impact, in order to be impacted by that reality. There is truly such a thing as generational trauma, multi-generational trauma. It is a reality. We are uh, a study of it. But there's also studies what happened to the Jews. Now, they were able to mitigate a lot of what they did by the way they approached it. And a lot of the things like you hear, we're told to shut up and forget what we went through. Their, their, their mantra is never again. And what does that mean? Everybody has to remember what happened. Think about it. They tell us uh, to constantly forget. But when they were slaughtered at the Alamo, what, what happened? What was the mantra? Remember the Alamo. But we're, we're supposed to get forget slavery. Stop letting the people who are oppressing you set your paradigms. Stop letting the person who has no desire to serve your interests set the course of your life. Look, I could go on and on about that, but I just had to address that. I'm like, I'm like, the dude just say that. Like I said, it, it, when, when, when white people say it, it doesn't even phase me because my, my, my responsibility isn't to educate you. It isn't to convince you of anything. I don't need you to believe what I'm talking about for me to have what I'm saying I'm taking. So I don't need to sit up there and communicate to you. I'm, I, you're the last person I'm worried about. I don't, you'll never see me on their sites when they're going in talking all the stuff that few people know they're talking. People come, you need to go over here and see what they're saying. I don't care less what they're saying. They've always thought it. They've always thought it. Now there are things that are happening where a lot of them are being held accountable for it because it's being recorded and it looks ugly. But the thing is, they've always thought that. They've never had a high opinion of you. They've tolerated you. 
They've tolerated you. Look on that note, I'm gonna get off. I'm gonna get ready to finish everything I'm getting ready to do uh, here in the office, and then I'm headed to the gym, and then I'm gonna spend time with baby um, and the family, whatever ones are gonna be there. But uh, I just had to drop in and actually, you know, share that with you. You guys have an unbelievable uh, Sunday. I plan on doing the same thing. Who knows? I might drop back in on you. Depends on. Uh, where I'm at and what's going on, but I had to uh, share that with you. You guys have a great day. Don't forget, sponsor the uh, sponsor space in the book so that you can pay tribute to someone you want to pay tribute to. On that note, I'm out. Mm -hmm.